Hi, and welcome to our Organizational Behavior Podcast today. I want to talk to you about the idea of individual characteristics. Those are those things that separate us from other folks in the workplace. Uh, Basically, these are the differences that impact what people think, feel, and do. So, for example, things like competencies. You know, we have knowledge, skills, and abilities that we can use in, in the workplace. Our emotions, our personality, and attitudes. Those are the four different categories we're going to look at today. Competencies. How do we do that? Well, you know, you're in my class. You're, you're here to learn something, to gain some skills. Uh, you can get on the job training, offering uh, coaching, getting training, going to university, uh, job rotation, developmental programs there, job enrichment, uh, apprenticeships, leadership development programs, things like this. Uh, we can offer seminars. You know, we, we're going to train our people up so that they're good at their jobs. And that's one of the more important things we do as managers. We develop our competencies in our employees. There's models based upon what level that you're functioning at. Do we do it organization-wide? Do we do it within the function? Do we do it within the individual role? Or do we do it specifically for your job? I'm not going to go into too much of that because it's not terribly relevant. But, you know, we, we, we look at all of this stuff. And we talk about also things like emotions. Emotions are important. Uh, it used to be that we, you know, we wouldn't think about them much. You know, that people would come to the workplace; they were supposed to leave all that emotional stuff at home. But that's just not fact-based. The fact is, you know, people come as, as holistic individuals, so we got to treat you know the entire person within the workplace, not just the things that we'd like them to bring. Uh, it's a relatively new area of research. There's only been about 20 years worth of it, so I've actually watched it grow. Uh, what, there's a, a guy down at UQ that does a lot of this stuff who's quite good at it. But, you know, people bring positive emotions, they bring negative emotions, and they bring that into the workplace. If they've had a a bad day at home, they're going to bring it to the job. There's just no way around that. So as managers, we we need to figure out how to deal with that. And all emotions are important. You know, not only the ones they display, but the ones that, you know, that they're feeling at this moment and they keep inside. And, of course, if we're going to discuss emotions, we also need to talk about something that's become increasingly popular, the idea of emotional intelligence sometimes called EQ. Uh, Daniel Goldman is the one who led the way on, on developing this concept. And it's important, but if you if you read any of Goldman's work, he's trying to sell it as the be-all, end-all, that people who are much more emotionally intelligent make better leaders, and it's much more important than anything else. And I'm not convinced of that. Uh, it's important, yes, because people who are more in touch with their own emotions, who are more emotionally stable, are better to work with pretty simple concept. Uh, They're they're readily able to manage our emotions and they're better able to relate to people. But is it more important than IQ? There's a lot of research that shows that, uh, well, one of my professors at Iowa uh, was one of the world's leading experts in this and he showed that IQ or general mental ability was the single biggest predictor of job performance, which is not surprising. Smarter people tend to do better at the job, you know, go figure. But, you know, this leads us into the idea of personality next. Uh, Personality, a long-term debate is whether it was, you know, heredity or environment. There's those fascinating twin studies that were, you know, that were done decades ago. But at the end of the day, on on almost all of this heredity and environment stuff, it comes down to about 50-50. There's some variation between 40 to 60, depending upon what characteristic we're looking at. But it's not terribly relevant to us. What we want to do is talk about personality. Uh, Big five personality types. The big five is, is kind of you know the gold standard for what we do in organizational science. Uh, there's five different characteristics we look at. Extroversion. An extrovert is someone who's who, who is out, outwardly going, is outgoing, who talks to people, not someone who sits in the corner you know and, and is silent Sally. Uh, agreeableness. Uh, we all know people in our lives who disagree with us on everything just because they can. These folks are, score very low on agreeableness, and they're not fun to work with because uh, they tend to be argumentative. But people are very high on agreeableness, on the other hand, might be too easy going. They might be agree too often, and then we don't tend to get their input as we should. Third one is conscientiousness. We pretty much know what conscientiousness is. Do you do a good job? I mean, do you bring that attitude to whatever job you're doing that you're going to do it well? Uh, emotional stability, important because emotionally unstable people are not fun to be around. Uh, and, and people who are more emotionally stable tend to be focused more on their job. And that's important to us as managers. And the fifth 
uh, personality characteristics we want to look at is openness to experience. That is, do people, are you one of those people who likes new experiences, who, 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 who looks as adventuresome, not necessarily a type T, a thrill seeker, but someone who is open to learning, to doing something new, or, or do you prefer in a very comfortable rut? You know, are, are you that type of person who once you get into that rut, you don't want to leave it? Uh, those things will affect your job performance. This inevitably leads into uh, personality types. The biggest instrument here is the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And it measures four basic dimensions, introvert, extrovert, sensing, intuiting, thinking, feeling, judging, and perceiving. I have to admit I'm not a big fan. Uh, as a researcher, when I'm using a psychological instrument, I want it to be reliable and valid. The MBTI is neither. But there's a huge industry in just administering these things for about $50 a pop to new employees. I quizzed a uh, personnel director for a large corporation back in my home state. Uh, about this one time in my class, and I said, okay. He, he said, oh, of course we use the MBTI. I said, you have research then that shows within your industry that certain personality types perform better? No. Do you have research within your own company that says that certain personality types are better to work with? No. So I said, well, why don't you use, you know, tarot cards then, because they'd be just as accurate. And he got a little angry with me, but uh, I was trying to make a valid point that, you know, even at that po point in time, 50 bucks a pop for a test that doesn't really tell you anything was not really worthwhile investing for his company. I, sh I shouldn't wait. He could save his company a whole lot of money. He wasn't happy with me. Oh, well. So we have these personality inventories, projective tests, Rorschach diagrams, you know, all these things you know, are, are role-playing interviews. These things help us to learn something about the people that we're working with. And your company will probably be giving you know, some type of personality test somewhere down, down the pike. The final thing we want to look at is attitudes. You know, basically a few of these. Self-efficacy, Machiavellianism, locus of control, and self-monitoring. By an attitude, this is the way that people project themselves. You know, the, the way that they approach life, if you will. Self-efficacy is the confidence that someone experiences relative to a particular task. That is, uh, job-based self-efficacy. I'm good at my job. I like my job. Therefore, I'm going to be satisfied in my job. We spent years looking at, well, people who are... are have high satisfaction or better at their jobs, the other way around. People who are good at their jobs are more satisfied with their jobs because they're good at it. They like it. Pretty simple. Uh, so we got organizational-based self-efficacy that is based within the job environment, and then they're just being good at what we do. Uh, Machiavellianism. Uh, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote a book called The Prince, talking about uh, the, the, some of the Italian nobles and how they approached you know, sharing power, or not sharing power in their case, exercising power. And I think he got a bad rap, but that's neither here nor there. You ought to read The Prince sometime. He, he wasn't advocating you know, this type of power wielding. He was just saying this is, how, this is how they did it. But it's the attitudes towards people based on the character from the novel on power and politics. But basically what Machiavellianism is, are people willing to use power in an illegitimate way to serve their own needs and not those of, of, them, of those around them or the organization? Uh, and there's a pretty good test for that called Mach V, which I think I have a link for you online. So I follow through on that. Uh, then we have locus of control. Locus of control is do you feel that you can uh, change your own destiny, that you, you have power over the, the, the path of your life, if you will? Uh, or, 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 or are you just one of those people who feels unlucky? Well, you know, if I was luckier, my life would be better. Well, there's an old saying, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I got. And there's some truth to that. Being that you guys are business students, you know, you're going to be in a certain part of this, by the way, you know, that your, your self-selection into a business program will tell me that you're more likely to have an internal locus of control than an external one. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at university. You know, you, you just say, well, I don't need to, all this education stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll get lucky or not. So it, it's a very basic view of the world. Uh, so... Is your performance evaluation based upon, gee, you know, the boss doesn't like me or because I'm good at my job? Those kinds of things. Uh, finally, we get to self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is ability to look at ourselves, particularly you know, in, a, in a work environment, and judge our own behavior. You know, can, can we be that little voice on, you know, on our shoulder that says, you know, you really need to act professionally here? Uh, that we, can we fit into the circumstances? You know, are we able to adjust our behavior based on the environment. Uh, is, there's the cocktail party, Dwight, 
you know, there's the lecturing Dwight, and then there's the Dwight, you know, who gives speeches to large groups of people. These are different people, mostly. I mean, it's, it's all me at the core, but I fit into different environments in different ways. And the way, to, the way you do that is through self-monitoring. You know, you watch yourself, you think about yourself, and, you know, you get things done that way. You project a certain image, and that's what we mean by the idea of self-monitoring. Well, that's all I have to talk to you about today. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back again very soon. Bye-bye.